Hello, and welcome back to my channel, Civil War Reports. I am your War of the Rebellion reporter, Brian Thomas Kopak, and today we're going to be taking a look at General James J. Arthur and his brigade on the first day of battle here at Gettysburg, July 1st, 1863. When General Hill agreed to send General Heath's division to Gettysburg to obtain supplies, particularly shoes, as General Heath has uh, gone down in history as stating, the first brigade of General Heath's division to be in column to march was General Archer's brigade. They were not the first brigade to be engaged. That honor would go to General Davis's brigade. Hill also decided to send behind General Heath's division the division of General Dorsey Pender. So this was a little bit more than a reconnaissance in force. This really was what really must be accepted as a, a full-scale invasion of the of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, really in contradictory contradiction to General Lee's orders to avoid a general engagement. But who was General Ar James J. Archer. Well, he was born on December 19, 1817 in Bel Air, Maryland. He would study at Princeton in the state of New Jersey, and after that he would study law at the University of Maryland. When the Mexican War broke out, he was a captain, and he served in the Mexican War with distinction, earning a brevet to the rank of major. He then resigned from the military, but went back to the military before the Civil War, and he was a captain in the 9th U.S. Infantry at the start of the American Civil War. He then resigned his commission to throw his lot with the Confederate States of America, where he was made a colonel of the 5th Texas. And he would serve in the Army of Northern Virginia, and at the Battle of Fair Oaks, General, and I hope I get his name right here, Robert Hatton, H-A-T-T-O-N, sorry folks, I'm not the best with names, was uh, killed pretty much instantly at the Battle of Fair Oaks, and Archer would assume command of his Tennessee Brigade. And it would be pretty much that brigade that he would be leading here at the Battle of Gettysburg. It was 5 a.m. on Wednesday, July 1st, 1863, when General Heath put his division in motion, heading towards Gettysburg in what would ultimately be the biggest battle of the American Civil War. Now, got to remember on June 30th, Heath and General Hill believed that the only thing that could possibly be in Gettysburg was local militia. And that could probably explain why he, uh, Heath put his artillery in front. Maybe he was figuring, okay, well, you know, we're not going to encounter the Army of the Potomac today. We're only going to encounter some local militia, and we'll really put the fear of the Confederacy into them by putting our artillery in front, because usually the infantry leads. Behind the artillery was General Archer's brigade, followed by General Davis's brigade. General Davis was a nephew of the Confederate President, Jeff Davis. So it was 5 a.m., when Archer's brigade left the Cashtown area towards Gettysburg. So on the morning of July 1st, General Heath had two of his brigades, Archer and Davis, back in the Cashtown area. His other two brigades, those commanded by General Pittigrew and Colonel Brockenbrow, were closer to Marsh Creek. And it was about around 6 a.m when General Archer's brigade passed through the most western part of those two brigades bivouacked on their way to here, Marsh Creek, and eventually on to Gettysburg. Pettigrew had some of his men as far east as the western bank of Marsh Creek, and it would be shortly before 7 a.m that General Archer's men would pass through this final bivouac, shall we say, of fellow Heath Division Confederates. And shortly up this road, they would 
encounter pickets from General John Buford's cavalry, and it would be there that the first shot of the Battle of Gettysburg would be fired. On the night of June 30th, General Buford pretty much covered all of the avenues leading into Gettysburg, both north and west of the town. I am standing at the corner, the intersection, of modern day Route 30, the Chambersburg Pike, and Knoxland Road. And it was here in this area that two privates from the 8th Illinois, Private Kelly and Private Hall, were stationed. And on that foggy Wednesday morning, they could see off in the distance, looking towards Marsh Creek, what appeared to be columns of infantry moving towards them. And they finally were able to make out the red Confederate battle flag, and they knew that a large body of Confederates were heading towards Gettysburg. So Private Kelly mounts up and rides off to try to find his sergeant, Sergeant Schaefer. Unable to locate Sergeant Schaefer, he does come across his lieutenant, Marcellus Jones. He informs Jones of what's happening and they ride back to this area. At around the same time, Sergeant Schaefer rides up also. Jones sees the columns of artillery and infantry coming this way and he asks Sergeant Schaefer for his carbine. Lieutenant Jones rests it on a rail fence that was here and he says, allow me the opportunity to open this ball he positions the carbine, sights it up, and fires at a man on a white or light gray horse. He misses, doesn't hit anybody, but that is considered the first shot of the Battle of Gettysburg. And it is from here that the Union Cavalry will begin its delaying action in an effort to slow down those Confederates before they get to Gettysburg in time for General Reynolds to arrive with his first corps of infantry. Buford's men did exactly what he wanted them to do. His cavalry posted along the Chambersburg Pike here, slowed down the Confederates to the point where by the time General Heath got to this area, Hers Ridge, he put his first two divisions sorry, his first two brigades, Archers and Davis, into line of battle. Archer would be stationed on the Confederate right, Davis on the Confederate left. Now, as you head in closer to town, as you get closer to uh, the Gettys modern day Gettysburg National Military Park, you're gonna cross over a small stream along Route 30, and that stream is called Willoughby Run, and again, Archer would be on one side, Davis would be on the other. But the cavalrymen that were out here slowed them down so much that by the time they got to McPherson's Ridge, General Reynolds had already started to arrive with his first corps. So I'm next to this monument here for the 26th North Carolina, and to my left is a trail, and that trail will lead you down to Willoughby Run. And Archer has been criticized that when his brigade was approaching, you know, the modern day battlefield, he halted his men on the western side of the stream. And that delay kind of infuriated Heath because his other brigade, Davis's, was already engaged and he was really hoping that a simultaneous attack by both Davis and Archer would be enough to drive the Yankees out of here. Because again, remember, he's originally thinking that he's only going to be fighting some home guard here, not cavalry dismounted from the Army of the Potomac. And really that delay, while in Archer's mind was the right thing to do because he was looking behind him to see where his supports were, and he really had no idea what was on the other side of this hill. So he delayed until he could figure out 
what was really in front of him and where his supports were. So when Archer put his brigade in motion and brought them to the eastern side of Willoughby Run, they had to climb up a rather steep hill. And as a result, part of his brigade became dislodged from the rest of the brigade. The 7th Tennessee would be held up due to a small quarry that was here at the time. And the fighting here would be intense because the Union infantry that arrived on the scene to take on Archer's brigade was the Iron Brigade, the famed Iron Brigade. Yes, the First Corps had arrived and the Black Hats were gonna take on Archer's Brigade coming up this hill. They were also aided, the Iron Brigade was also aided by the 14th Brooklyn of Cutler's Brigade. And the fighting here was pretty intense and it was the fighting that took place here early in the battle that would result in General John Reynolds being killed instantly here at Gettysburg on July 1st. But the Iron Brigade was able to counterattack and push Archer's men back down this hill, back across Willoughby Run, and it was there that General Archer would be captured, hiding in some thickets, and he would be the first general officer of the Army of Northern Virginia to be captured under the tenure of General Robert E. Lee. The honor of capturing General Archer would go to Private Patrick Mahoney of the 2nd Wisconsin. However, the fruits of his victory would be very short-lived as he would be killed in action later that day. So once General Archer was captured, he was brought back to the Union lines and made his way towards Seminary Ridge where General Abner Doubleday, who was in command now of the Union forces following the death of General Reynolds, was there to greet Archer. And according to the reports, he was uh, very cordial and Abner Doubleday said to uh, General Archer, and I quote, Good morning, Archer. How are you? I'm glad to see you. To which Archer replied to his old army buddy, quote, Well, I'm not glad to see you a damn sight, end quote. So what happened to Archer's brigade and Archer following the capture? Well, Archer's brigade did suffer very heavy casualties in those opening moments of the Battle of Gettysburg. And command of the brigade fell to Colonel Burkett Fry of the 13th Alabama. And they were ordered to the extreme right of Heath's line to guard against a possible Union attack from the Hagerstown Road, which, well, never happened. And as for Archer himself, well, things did not go well for him. Archer always seemed to be in frail health, and the march to Pennsylvania did not help his health at all. And after he was captured, he was uh, sent to both Johnson Island and to Fort Delaware. And unfortunately, his confinement did nothing to improve his health and everything to make it worse. He would be exchanged in August of 1864, but however, by that point in time, he was in extremely frail health. And while he was returned to the Army of Northern Virginia, situations for him only got worse, and he would pass away on October 26th, 1864, at the age of 46. And if you like what you saw today, please hit the subscribe button. Give a thumbs up. Also, notify your friends. Let them know about this channel and ask them to subscribe as well. If you like, you may leave a question or a comment below, and perhaps I will answer your question in a future episode of Civil War Reports. Until next time, please keep the history alive.